A few minutes ago I realized that my video on keeping and breeding glowworms just went over 10,000 visits. It is the most watched and also the most liked video on my channel, uh, but also the most disliked. But YouTube doesn't want you to see those dislikes anymore. Um, I had planned to do a reaction kind of video on that uh, for quite some time now, and I have prepared a script actually. Uh, but I think I'll just uh, wing it. Yeah. It was my first video on YouTube with an actual voiceover and I bought a new microphone for that. Just for that and I'm still using this one right here. So uh, let's get started and see if my advice from back in 2016 still holds up. Whoa, 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 whoa. Stop it right there. Um, that font, uh, that shall not be named. Uh, I have to admit it was my favorite font back in the day. I think I, 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 I even used it in job applications. Uh, I don't do that anymore. Meanwhile, I have moved on to a different font and this one is uh, Candera. So uh, there has been a bit of personal growth, I guess. On the other hand, I think the part of my uh, reasoning for liking this new font is that it reminds me of the Kandarian dagger. So uh, I guess there goes personal growth. Uh, but it is progress, I guess. And um, yeah, also the uh, aspect ratio is weird, I guess. This is because it uh, came from my uh, old video camera back then. That was the reason that uh, determined uh, the aspect ratio of my videos back then, I guess. Anyway, uh, moving on with comic... Oh, you know the, what I mean. The font type. I have been keeping glowworms for quite some time now. I want to briefly share how I do this. Now, I do realize this will be useful to very few people, but for those, it might be really useful. Yes, indeed. The few reactions I'm getting are usually quite thankful. Um, uh, I am also getting reactions like, uh, what have you been drinking? But uh, those are a few compared to the uh, thankful ones. Yeah. I do not want to promote glowworms and fireflies as pets. Most of the time, you will be dealing with creepy crawly larvae. Also, their light isn't all that impressive. Or enduring. At least not in the species Lampris sardinian. Huh, that's weird. I thought I had pronounced the species name more uh, in an English style, or perhaps you could even say uh, Americanized, uh, something like Lampyris sardinia. But apparently it was more a mix between uh, an a German and an English pronunciation, and back in Latin class I was taught that the German pronunciation is actually quite close to the Latin uh, pronunciation, so I guess Lampyris Sardinie would be more correct. But uh, as a, a really uh, cheesy Austrian musician once uh, sang, I guess, it really doesn't matter what you say, because in English it sounds better anyway. So, uh, Lampyris has a certain ring to it, I have to admit. But uh, it's Lampyris sardinie, or just a sardinian glowworm. But even with other lamprey species, you most likely won't be able to put their luminescence into any meaningful use. Look for romantic lighting in other directions. To enjoy raising these insects, you basically have to be obsessed about lamprets. I mean, uh, really enthusiastic about them. Although I used this setup with some success also for other species. Yep, it definitely works for Lampyrus noctiluca, a close relative to Lampyrus sardinia and one of the most common glowworm species. I haven't really tried out this uh, sponge cloth method on other species, which uh, was the focus of this video back then. Um, so um, 
I can't really be sure about that, so, but uh, definitely for uh, the, that common globum species, the Lampyrus noctiluca. Lampyrus sardinia is the species this setup is really tried and true for. These glowworms originate, big surprise I know, from the island of Sardinia. Back in 2004, I was able to obtain a few larvae from that Mediterranean island. Now, in 2016, the 17th generation of their offspring has hatched. By now we have the year 2022 and my colony is currently on the verge of generation 24. Nice! Since most of their lifespan is taken up by the larval stage, keeping glowworms is mostly keeping their larvae. For this purpose I simply use airtight clip boxes sold for keeping food fresh. Because they are airtight, there won't be any gaps between lid and box. For proper ventilation I punch some holes in the middle of the lid and open the boxes during regular inspections. Yep, those clip boxes are still mwah, chef's kiss, the optimal choice for keeping glowworms in my opinion. The only change uh, from back then, I guess, is that I punch in some more air holes now, just to ensure some better ventilation. My substrate of choice are moist, biodegradable sponge cloths. They are composed of cellulose and stabilized with the cotton net, and can soak up and store water real good. For a long time, I was using coconut fiber bricks that you soak in water to create a nature-like substrate. They are sold for terrariums and as a plant soil. Sure it looks nice, but the biggest problem is that larvae are often left behind when putting the inhabitants into a freshly prepared container. They just hide in and under the coconut stuff, so I had to keep the old boxes around for quite some time to make sure I really transferred all the larvae. Other problems are that it is somewhat hard to judge its freshness. It has about the same color as glowworm poo. And darkwing fungus gnats like to use it for breeding. Also, the substrate can get a little bit messy to handle. When I started keeping the worms, I was exclusively using this coconut fiber soil. And um, I was mighty proud of myself when I discovered this sponge cloth method. It was based on a somewhat peculiar isopod setup idea I found on YouTube. And um, it worked really well. It is a nice clean method. Um, I still use the sponge cloth method sometimes, especially for keeping the adults and having them mate and lay eggs. But for the larvae I'm using a more bioactive kind of setup with uh, springtails and all. And I actually buy dirt, not just uh, plain coconut fiber but real uh, uh, earth mix. Um, just to be sure that there are no uh, hazardous organisms contained inside. And as heights I am using leaf litter and if I feel extra fancy pantsy hoidy toidy I am using sea almond leaves. That's uh, a bit uh, excessive and uh, indulgent I guess. Or dare I say even decadent. But I am recycling those and put them in my aquarium for the shrimps and snails to eat. But back to the sponge cloths. After a thorough wash with clear water, squeeze them out well so they are moist but not dripping wet. Rip them to shreds and arrange them in the box. I do not advise to cover the whole bottom of the box with just one piece, as larvae might be trapped underneath it. And that's basically all there is to this setup. Yep, plain and simple. Larvae are skilled escapists, especially the very young ones. Those might even reach the air holes in the middle of the lid. So you might want to secure these holes by taping a cotton pad over them. Paper towels are fine as well. Shallow spoons, like those used for ice cream, are nice for picking up single or a few larvae. After watching a whole lot of tarantula and moth keeping videos on YouTube, I have upgraded to using a brush and I no longer use those ice cream spoons but a little thingy that looks somewhat like a small soup ladle but it is actually a tool used in a local tea ceremony to put the cream and the tea in a very specific way. 
And this is excellent for picking up glowworm larvae because they uh, can really be pushed into it and they don't f fall off easily because of the high rim of it and it works uh, really well. However, with this setup you don't have to pick up larva after larva. For a cleanup you simply prepare a fresh box and then you transfer the larvae easily and quickly like this. Though not that quickly. This footage is sped up 8 times. Just take each piece of the sponge cloth and gently push or shake the larvae off into the new container. Lightly blowing on them makes them loosen their grip or even drop down by themselves. Junk like excrement, noticeable as soaked in brown stains, shed skins and even food remnants, okay maybe apart from big empty snail shells, will almost completely stay on the cloth. Those larvae that are not sticking to the sponge cloth can even be more easily transferred, simply by shaking them loose and pouring the heap of larvae in. That's probably the biggest advantage of the sponge cloth method. It's really easy peasy lemon squeezy to uh, to clean them up and prepare a new container. However, you have to clean them up more often because uh, the dirt just sticks around in there and um, you just have to clean it up more often but it is really easy to do. With the more bioactive setup the little springtails um, consume food remnants and excrement and the like so uh, as a result the whole container stays fresh and good for uh, much longer but when you have to clean it up uh, it's uh, more stressy depressy lemon zesty I guess because it's just like with the uh, coconut soil setup, it's uh, a bit messy and um, it gets everywhere like sand <laughs> and uh, you can never be sure that all larvae are transferred and you have to keep the old uh, container around and check it out occasionally to make sure that there are no larvae left behind and burrowed underneath the substrate which is uh, just not possible with the sponge cloth uh, method you can see each and every larva in there. Another disadvantage of the bioactive setup is that it leaves a lot more wiggle room for little pests and nuisances like fungus gnats or some mites and uh, they tend to reproduce much more often in those kind of bioactive setups than in the sponge cloth method. Um, there they are basically absent. I tried a kind of biological pest control by introducing some pseudoscorpions to uh, feast on those mites and fungus gnat larvae, um, but the results were uh, inconclusive and I cannot rule out that they might harm the larvae, the glowworm larvae actually. So uh, I guess uh, that's uh, nothing I will try out again in the near future, so I'll have to clean it up more often and be extra careful not to introduce those little pests and nuisances. But uh, on the whole I am more on the bioactive setup side now. Again. So yeah, everything has good and bad sides to it, just like in the rest of life, I guess. Okay, now I'm going to talk about feeding the larvae. The fact is, firefly larvae are actually quite nasty little predators. So. If you're not comfortable with the harsh realities of the food chain, you might want to pass. To give you a hint, let Hannibal Lecter of all people introduce you about their diet. Yeah, I remember back then I was uh, basically just slaughtering some snails for my glowworm colony and watching Hannibal afterwards and suddenly the amount of snail imagery uh, started to rise and uh, then finally uh, fireflies were introduced as a topic and I had to perform a little reality check and make sure that I wasn't just losing my mind. In episode 5 of season 3 of the TV series Hannibal, we reminiscence. I kept cochlear gardens as a young man to attract fireflies. Their larvae would devour many times their own weight in snails. Fuel. To power a transformation into a delicate creature of such beauty. His female companion then proposes a toast to the misfortune of the snail. Well, in the show they used North American fireflies, mostly CGI, and one shot of a real beetle. Those actually feed on earthworms. Lampyris sardinia will eat chopped up earthworms as well. 
In fact, Canadian nightcrawlers, which are readily available at fish bait shops, uh, at least in Germany and I guess in many other parts of the world too, uh, Canada for example, uh, make a very bountiful uh, food source. Earthworms also make a good substitute for slugs and snails, because I managed to raise L1 larvae all the way to L2, with solely feeding them earthworms, and I guess that means that it is a sufficient source of nutrients for them. So yeah, uh, earthworms as a substitute food, or maybe they even hunt them in nature, cannot be sure about that. Uh, they are a good food source, yes. But like the fireflies that Hannibal really would have had in his cochlea gardens, Lampreyza splendidula by the way, Lampyris sedinia is more at home feasting on snails and slugs. A word of caution about slugs. They might turn the tables and return the favor, as they are able to feed on freshly molted larvae. If you want to play it safe, only provide them cut into pieces. I observed one instance where a snail was actually feeding on the pupa of a sardinian glowworm, so be careful anyway, whether you are using slugs or snails. Always be careful. I prefer feeding snails. Since the opening of the shell limits how many larvae can feed on a snail, I sometimes feed them crushed snails. This way even young larvae can tackle fully grown garden snails in a kind of communal feeding. Yes, there's actually a snail under all these larvae. Crushed Kepaia nemoralis or Kepaia hortensis are actually now my preferred food option, at least from spring to autumn, when they are readily available, at least uh, in the area where I live. If snails and slugs are hard to find outside, for instance in winter, aquatic snails are an excellent source of nutrition. Apple snails were a nice treat, well, at least until they got banned in the EU here, because apparently some invasive species of them had been munching on Italian rice paddies. Indeed, even outside of winter, small freshwater snails are a wonderful source of food for young larvae. So it's always nice to keep a healthy big population of, say, ram's horn or bladder snails in your aquarium. I'm very fond of those. Oh yeah, and regarding those apple snails, I somewhat recently found a species that uh, belongs to a genus that is not banned in the European Union, and it is Azulenus pixi, and I'm trying to breed those, but uh, so far I do not have success. Something seems to eat those egg clutches. Hmm, but I will keep on trying. And on another note, uh, I even fed my Sardinian glowworms some uh, marine snails, actually. Litorina litorea, I think uh, periwinkle is the common name in English, and um, those were left over from a science experiment in a lab I was working, and um, they fed on it, and I fed them for maybe a few weeks or a few months, and they were frozen thawed. Well, I do feed on them, but I wouldn't try to keep them solely on a diet of marine snails. It seems somewhat weird, but a more on weird food substitutes later on in this video. Also, the near constantly produced offspring of giant African land snails make a good food. And yes, one of my breeding specimens had three eye stalks. I still like to keep some of those around as a backup food supply. I will now list some of the weirder food options that I found out after recording my video back then. Well, they also feed on mussel meat, not with a C, uh, but uh, as in mytilus edulis, that is sold as fish food in frozen form, high protein beetle jelly, sugar, as in sucrose, diluted honey water, cut up wax worm fresh slices of mango fruit, and I guess many many things more that I haven't tried out yet. But I'm not too sure if uh, all those options would be a sufficient food supply. Probably not in most cases. But even in winter I find uh, slugs outside, as long as it's uh, slightly above 5 degrees Celsius, then I can usually find still some slugs and even some earthworms, which are also a quite uh, complete food supply, I think. Basically, boxes for adults can be the same as for the larvae. 
I like to keep them a bit less humid than the lavo boxes and provide a thorough aeration. It is good to have a little more height and something to crawl on to encourage the female's glowing behavior. Under these conditions even the male might crawl up to an elated position and start a short flight, but in general the males appear to be somewhat lazy flyers. Oh, so very lazy. This is the only instance I managed to actually catch it on video. Enjoy. Small terrariums for mantises are a very fancy option. Butterfly cages with a very fine gauze might work for extended flight maneuvers. I bought something like that, but never tried it out so far. Oh, and by the way, no need for feeding. The adults have atrophied mouth parts. They subsist on reserves accumulated as larvae. This is why they only live for a few weeks at best. I just keep my boxes at normal room temperature and in indirect natural light. I never really tried a hibernation during winter. However, I allow the room to be somewhat cooler in winter and the days are automatically shorter since I prefer natural light. However, it seems to help to get mature larvae to actually pupate if you simulate the conditions of day and night during midsummer. That's what I have observed and it has been shown for a firefly species with aquatic larvae that they actually require those light conditions, otherwise they die as big mature larvae. Hmm. Young larvae, however, seem to do very well under more dark conditions. This is the care routine. Adjusting humidity. Prevent excessive condensation droplets or even small puddles of water, but at the same time never let the sponge cloth dry out. It usually keeps enough moisture until a fresh one is applied anyway. Oh, this reminds me. The buildup of condensation water droplets is also more excessive in the sponge cloth setup. Um, that's another disadvantage of it. And um, also sometimes when, I guess when the air is more dry, static electricity can build up and this uh, might even lead to a young small larvae or shed skins sticking to the container uh, because of uh, those different charges attracting each other. You know, like uh, rubbing a balloon on your sweater and then it attracts little uh, paper clips or something just like that and that's not very nice. So uh, two little uh, more disadvantages of the sponge cloth setup and as I mentioned I am team bioactive by now. Feeding. About once a week for very young larvae. Older ones are fine with the meal every few weeks or maybe once a month. If you want the larvae to mature fast you can power feed them and basically have food permanently available to them. This will make them mature fast but uh, they will tend to stay smaller, so not very big females and therefore less eggs. If you feed them less often, the larvae tend to grow bigger, but over a longer time period. That's something you may want to prioritize if you want to have the next generation quickly or larger in numbers. This is a well-fed larva. Note the bloated appearance and the stretch mark, so to speak, between the dorsal plates. The stretch mark is more pronounced in young larvae. Hungry larvae will roam the box, especially at the edges, with questing head movements. You will also hear them calling you Seymour and telling you to feed them. Or maybe that's just me. No separate water sources need to be given. Only really dehydrated larvae, like this escapee here, will drink from droplets or water soaked stuff. Hygiene. Collecting food remnants, shed skins, etc. as needed. Pincers are nice for that. In case of bigger messes, transfer to a fresh box as shown beforehand. Like I mentioned, sponge cloth setup, quick and easy, bioactive setup, pain in the uh, um, lower back, but uh, less often necessary. A few words about the breeding procedures. I store the pupae separated by sex and let them hatch. These are females. And here are the males. Easy to distinguish from the females by their big eyes and fully developed wings. Some days after shedding the chrysalis the mating can take place. I usually wait until the female shows its glowing behavior before I introduce the males to it. With good timing, many breeder individuals can produce a large clutch of eggs together. 
but even if kept semi-wild in a nature like terrarium with all stages and sexes mixed, reproduction can be successful. However, under controlled conditions, it is preferable to separate the sexes after mating again, so the females can lay their eggs undisturbed. Some years of continued breeding later, I think I can say it uh, doesn't really matter if male and female stay together after mating. The female lays its eggs anyway, and the male doesn't seem to be too much of a disturbance, unlike as in humans, I guess. After about a month, the larvae will hatch, but some eggs may take longer to develop. Like, uh way longer. Some of them might even hatch not before the next generation is hatching. So uh, be careful not to throw away any eggs that you assume won't hatch anymore. Remember, if you assume, you're making an ass out of you and me. The growth of the larvae is quite pronounced. These are the first four stages in comparison. And this is the first stage next to a mature larva shortly before pupation. Well, those are the basics of how I keep my glow on colony. Maybe more detailed videos to come. That's it for now. Cheers to the misfortune of the snail. Okay, I think uh, the video mostly holds up, but still, it is about time to redo it and make a new version, an updated version. Uh, or maybe uh, in multiple parts, but we shall see. It's about time. See you then.